we go. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We're going to give um, maybe another minute for attendees to join before we get started. Um, but just wanted to offer our, our welcome and to let you know we're here and we will get started momentarily. Great, welcome everyone again. It's 9.01 and we only have one hour for this webinar and we have a lot of rich, interesting content to get through. So I'm going to get us started. My name is Megan Anson and I'm a nutrition advisor with USAID's Bureau for Resilience and Food Security and I'm also the activity manager for Safira. I have the pleasure of serving as a moderator for today's webinar on how USAID's Safira project is studying egg consumption in Ethiopia. Before we begin, I wanted to briefly review a few housekeeping items. First, we've reserved approximately 20 minutes at the end of the webinar for a Q&A session. We ask that you please enter your questions into the chat box during the presentation so that we can queue these up for our panelists. Second, if you encounter any technical difficulties during today's webinar, please send a private chat to Ben Cox and Ben will help you to troubleshoot any issues you might be having. And finally, please note that this webinar is being recorded. The recording and the slides will be shared with all registered participants afterward. We have three great panelists today. I'm going to introduce each panelist and then we will get started. So first you will be hearing from Alyssa Klein. Alyssa is the project director of the USAID Ethiopia Studying Animal Food Markets in Rural Areas, Safira uh, Project. And she's also a technical advisor on the USAID Advancing Nutrition Project, supporting the food systems and health systems teams. She pro provides technical and operational support to improve evidence and capacity to improve multi-sectoral programming for nutrition outcomes. Alyssa received her master's degree from the Fletcher School um, at Tufts University in May 2011 with a focus on humanitarian assistance and community nutrition. Our second panelist is Ashley Ockeson. Ashley is an applied anthropologist, social and behavior change practitioner, and nutrition leader with 20 years of experience. She is a senior SBC advisor with USAID Advancing Nutrition. And she has a particular expertise in designing multi-sectoral nutrition programming, which leverages SBC principles and processes to increase effectiveness. And finally, our third panelist is Kala Baye. Dr. Baye has a PhD in health and nutrition. His research interests are maternal and child nutrition, micronutrients, and interventions to improve diet quality. He is involved in a number of projects that aim to improve diet quality through improved food systems. And with that, I'm going to turn over the presentation to our first panelist, Alyssa Klein. Great, thank you so much, Megan. Um, and Kim, you can advance um, to the next slide, please. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. 
I'm going to be giving just a brief overview of the Safira project, and then I'm going to turn it over to my colleagues Ashley and Kaleb to talk about the methodology and the findings from our first two rounds of formative research. Um, I wanted to mention that both of those rounds took place pre-COVID, and um, since then we've been a little bit um, paused, waiting to get out and do data collection for a third round of formative research. Obviously, we do not want to um, take any risks, so we, we've been waiting until things are, um, are safe on the ground for everybody involved. Um, so the Safira project is a research project that investigates a question um, key to maximizing the role that markets can play to support improved nutrition in the first thousand and thousand days. Um, so what we're doing, what that means is that we're assessing whether a market-centered approach that includes interventions that improve accessibility of animal source foods and activities that increase household demand for those foods can improve three primary behavioral outcomes. Um, those outcomes are increased weekly purchase of animal source foods by thousand day households, um, caregiver practices around purchase preparation and feeding of animal source foods to children in the six to 23 month of age range, and intake of animal source foods by children in that age range. Um, you will hear that in the first round of formative research, we selected eggs as the animal source foods that we're going to focus on. We're a small project, so we could not uh, be as broad as all animal source foods. Probably no project could. Um, so we will be focusing on eggs. Um, additionally, when we say market-centered interventions, uh, we mean a few things. We mean aligning our interventions and objectives um, with incentives of market actors or the supply side that we were talking about, but we also mean using physical rural markets as locations for our interventions, um, in part to reach consumers where they are, and in part to complement relatively resource intensive health sector interventions, um, like in inter group interpersonal communications and counseling interventions that take place in a community or a household level. Uh, we wanna focus kind of in the markets themselves, uh, if possible. Um, can you go to the next slide, please, Kim? Great, so just to tell you a little bit about Safira um, in terms of our, our project phases. Um, Safira was awarded um, from a USAID mechanism called a BAA. Um, what this essentially means is that it was a co-creation process. Um, so if, if you don't know what a BAA award is, um, a number of organizations put a short concept note in on a project that they would like to undertake and we're invited to a workshop where we sort of all worked together and co-created a new idea that um, that project partners could come together on. Um, so Safira, we ended up with a team where JSI is the prime implementer. Um, and then we are working with the Manoff group, um, with Austria from Ethiopia, and with IFPRI uh, for our project. And we also designed this project um, alongside USAID. Megan Anson actually helped us design um, as well. Um, once the project was awarded, the, uh, because it's a research project, we, we really focused heavily on formative research. We had initially anticipated uh, about two rounds of formative research before designing our intervention package. Um, however, as you will hear, we had a few really interesting findings that led to some um, outstanding questions. So we're currently designing and waiting to do data collection for a third round of uh, formative research, hopefully uh, in Q1 of next fiscal year, but we're being very patient until things are, are really safe for us to do so. Once we complete our formative research, we will then have a design workshop where we will be designing an intervention package. Um, the interventions, as I said before, will touch both supply and demand side um, behavior change and um, marketing activities. And the intervention will then take place for a one year period of time in 25 markets in Tigray, Ethiopia. At the same time that the intervention is taking, that the, the implementation is taking place that one year period, um, IFPRI will be uh, running a cluster randomized control trial for that same year. Um, and then when we wrap up, we'll be publishing our findings. So this is really a very small intervention, a short-term intervention, um, and we're looking to answer the research questions that I mentioned before. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ashley to talk about the methodology that we used for our formative research thus far. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, can everyone hear me okay? 
Yep, you're clear. You're a little bit quiet, but you're clear. Okay, super. Yeah, um, as it happens, um, sometimes uh, my laptop is not working this morning. So I'm doing this on my phone. So I apologize for any um, sort of shaky cam effects that are going on. Um, all right, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, the two, the first two rounds of formative research, particularly the uh, methodologies that we use uh, and the process. Um, and then uh, Dr. Kalib is going to share um, the really interesting findings that we came, uh, that, that came out of these first two rounds. Um, so before we did any formative research, we um, did a situational analysis where we looked at secondary data, quantitative and qualitative. We were building on really good work by Alive and Thrive uh, around promoting egg consumption using different um, community-based and uh, methodologies in Ethiopia. And um, you know, a lot of great work that Iskri and others have done around uh, market analyses and value chain analyses around animal source food in Ethiopia, some work that have been done around small and medium enterprises. Um, so that really helped us narrow down what our questions were for these first two rounds of formative research. In the first round, uh, next week. Um, and an exciting thing about this um, DAA mechanism is that it allowed us to do iterative formative research. So I'm sure many of you um, on the webinar know what a luxury that is. Um, in many projects, we're lucky if we can do one round of rapid formative uh, research. So we really wanted to take advantage of this opportunity um, to collaborate with quantitative and qualitative researchers um, across uh, disciplines like um, economics and social behavior change and multi-sectoral nutrition um, and really um, make the best out of this opportunity. So in the first round of formative research, we were wanting to just identify, uh, sorry, can you stay back on the previous slide? I'll tell you when to step forward. Thank you. We were looking to identify local barriers and enablers to selling, purchasing, and consuming animal source food. As uh, Alyssa said, this really wasn't a production um, intervention. We were looking at um, purchasing, selling, purchasing, and consuming, uh, especially feeding uh, animal source food to kids. So uh, the methods we used for that were structured observations of, of these rural marketplaces, interviewing animal source traders, um, and engaging parents, um, including some participatory food ranking, as well as more traditional purchasing discussions. And then in round two, uh, we wanted to, we took the findings from round one and used that to tailor round two to kind of try out some concepts around promoting eggs uh, with caregivers and consumers, and also to test out some negotiated practices with egg traders. So just to get into a little bit more detail uh, about round one, we were looking at uh, structured observation of rural markets. And a really interesting part of this methodology is that uh, you know, IFPRI is very used to doing quantitative assessments of rural markets, where they're looking at food availability and prices and maybe things like infrastructure and food safety. Um, and then uh, JSI and the Manoff group brought a more qualitative um, aspect to it, where we were looking at um, gender and age distribution across different parts of the markets, um, who is spending what kind of time there, at what time of day are people there, um, what are the different kinds of interactions going on, um, especially interactions between customers and sellers. Um, so then uh, we had focus group discussions separately with fathers of under two-year-olds and mothers of under two-year-olds. Um, and we started those off with a card sorting exercise which really asked people to rank different foods, animal source foods and non-animal source foods, according to several categories. And these categories are what we know people tend to value in foods, and it's building off of really great work by Gretel Pelto um, and others, uh, essentially saying that you know most people, they want food to be uh, affordable, healthful, they want their kids to like it, and, um, but especially they, they also want it to be convenient. So those are the kinds of things that we were uh, ranking. And then we followed that up with some discussion, looking especially at household food purchases. Who's making the decisions around that? Um, who's going shopping? Who's, uh, you know, um, who's preparing the food? Who's feeding the kids? And what do shoppers think about like on the day when they go shopping? What are their key considerations you know, while they're there? And then in the first round, we did key informant interviews with animal source food traders. Um, and Kyle will get into more detail about which traders we talked about. And so we talked to them fairly broadly about what are their livelihood strategies, you know, what part does animal source food trading play in their broader livelihood strategies, what are the risks, opportunities, and constraints that they see. Next. 
Um, and I'm not really going to get into detail on this slide. This is more for when we send out the slides after this. But just to make the point that um, qualitative research needs to be equally rigorous as quantitative research. Um, and part of doing that is segmenting your sample. Even if the samples are small, you need to segment your samples by meaningful differences. So for example, we segmented by larger and smaller markets, um, by those markets that were closer and further from town centers. And then we tried to pull our focus group discussions from um, families that would be covered, that were within a certain distance from the market. All right, so um, in round two, as I mentioned, we took those findings from round one, which uh, Kala was gonna talk about, and then we really narrowed down round number two to, to be two main methodologies. The first one was trials and improved practices with egg traders. Round one really helped us focus in on eggs as animal source food that we wanted to focus on um, for this intervention of purchasing and uh, increased purchase by households and increased feeding um, to kids under two. So, um, Let me tell you a little bit about Trials of Improved Practices. That was a methodology that was developed by the Manoff Group, which has now been widely adapted and used. Um, the idea is that you negotiate improved practices. Rather than going in and thinking you have the answer for what people should be doing, um, you kind of go in and you look at the situation, you look at the behavioral outcomes and the project outcomes you're looking for, and then you actually have discussions with whoever the priority group is, in this case, egg traders, uh, to find out what do they feel like is feasible to try. You kind of offer them a menu of options of behaviors to try. And if you think about it, it's kind of like field testing behaviors over a short period of time. Um, and a really exciting thing about Safira is that um, it was pretty innovative. It was an innovative use of trials and improved practices, or I'm gonna start saying TIPS now, which is the acronym. Um, it's been used in healthcare, among service providers, among caregivers, among teachers, um, but it hadn't really been used before with um, private sector market actors, and particularly in rural markets. So it was a really interesting uh, and learning process to apply this to that group of people. Um, so the way that TIPS works, you do a first visit just to observe what uh, the trader's day was like. So uh, we went and we, we sat in marketplaces uh, for a couple of hours for a morning and then for an afternoon in different markets just to see how did the flow of things go with these traders. And then right after that, we held a negotiation visit with, the, with the small groups of traders um, and we proposed uh, different uh, practices that they could try and I'm going to leave it to Khaled to uh, say which practices those were and which ones they agreed. And so these traders then agreed to try practice uh, for, I think we decided on like two market days, but for an agreed period after the negotiation. Um, and so then you leave folks alone to try out the new practices and then you go back for um, a third visit to find out, did it work, did it not work, did they make any adaptations? Um, and what this really basically does is it's an automatic way of finding out what's acceptable, what's feasible for people to do, and quite often they make some really interesting adaptations to the, to the practices, which then you can use as you're scaling. So, next. So the second methodology that we used um, in round two is we really, we needed to explore a little bit further. You know, round one really gave us a lot of insights about how do caregivers and consumers think about um, local foods. And how do they think about eggs in relation to those other local foods? So we were quite happy to find that eggs are you know, very acceptable. There are no particular um, cultural barriers against eggs in particular. As we know in Ethiopia, there's a lot of cultural stuff around um, not purchasing, preparing, and eating or feeding animal source foods during fasting days. Um, but other than that, people see eggs as being uh, more affordable than other animal source foods, though still expensive. Um, compared to non-animal source foods. Um, and yeah, and so um, we were wanted to build on our findings from round one and really start uh, doing some concept testing that would help us frame our SBC interventions down the line. So let me tell you a little bit about what concept testing is. Um, it's a methodology that's been used by private sector marketers and uh, social marketers and social behavior change folks and health communication folks for decades. Essentially what it is, it's uh, testing out emotional appeals, practical, you know, um, information about practical risks and benefits, 
um, specific calls to action to see if they're clear to people or if they want to make changes. Um, and equally importantly, it's about testing communication styles. Are people, you know, more receptive to messages about feeding their kids eggs if it's coming from a more sort of authoritative place, or are they more accepting if it's uh, coming from a sort of warmer, at homey kind of place, or if it's coming from a humorous place? So it's testing out ideas and styles of communication. It's not testing messages, quote unquote. That is something that comes along a lot later, but this concept testing will kind of give you the themes that you need to use. Um, so we did uh, some concept testing with mothers and fathers, again, of um, six months to two year olds um, separately from each other and came up with some really interesting stuff. Next. Again, just making the point that we um, segmented our markets and talked with, uh, for the concept testing and the tips, we worked with mothers and fathers and uh, different groups of egg traders for these different types of markets that we were looking at. Next. So again, this is more for when we send out the notes afterward, but uh, for each round of formative research, we had really um, qualified research assistants, so fluent to Greenia, knew the area, um, had done qualitative research before, and then we had supervisors who were spot checking the quality of things like that. Um, each day, we would um, transcribe the rough notes from the day and translate notes into English, and then as a team, kind of discuss what was coming out of the day um, and kind of identify emerging themes. And then um, Austria, our partner in Ethiopia, um, took the data and, and did a deeper textual analysis on it um, and using grounded theory to kind of pull out, you know, to look at the themes that we specifically asked about and to see if any themes were emerging as well. All right. So now I'm going to hand it over to um, Dr. Collins to share something about our findings. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley. Um, yeah, I'll be presenting the findings. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so as, uh, just a quick reminder, the first, round, the, the first round aimed to identify barriers and enablers to selling, purchasing, and consuming animal source foods. From the perspective of traders, but also households. And the second round explored options for interventions to increase the purchase and consumption of eggs. Uh, next slide, please. So we started with a, a market observation. Uh, as uh, Ashley indicated, we had about 12 markets uh, that varied in size and uh, an, an estimate of how many traders were involved in the, at the market day uh, was uh, was estimated. So we uh, have a size of, of a market that has about 2,000 to 12,000 traders. Uh, the combination of uh, permanent and visiting traders. Uh, and then um, purchasing was almost always conducted uh, by negotiation. And individuals selling and purchasing were men and women of all ages. Um, but what we noted is also that among animal source foods, only eggs and live animals were available. So you wouldn't have a butchery shop in, at the marketplace uh, and no dairy. Uh, next, next slide, please. So then uh, this was followed by a key informant interview with uh, traders of animal source foods uh, to know about this, their supply uh, and, and their perspective about the demand. Um, so, uh, the supply wise, they have a varied supply, including community members, uh, as well as suppliers visiting the market from, you know, collecting and coming from other markets. Uh, they do screen uh, the, their supplies and some of the um, um, parameters they look at is freshness, the size of the egg, the larger the size, the better it is, the color and price are some of the um, uh, parameters they look at. Uh, keeping time of the eggs uh, when they buy it, it could be any time from two weeks to two months. Uh, so again, here it indicates, uh, you know, if you're looking at the upper end, uh, you probably have some food safety issues or you're certainly having food safety issues there. Um, if they're unable to, sold, to sell the eggs, um, what would they do? Uh, they discard it, spoiled, sell it at a loss, transport it to a higher demand areas like uh, larger towns like Makali, or it would be consumed by the family uh, or end up being hatched. Um, looking at what their uh, perspective is in, in terms of demand, uh, their main purchasers are egg traders of larger towns, 
um, local cafeterias, shops, restaurants, uh, and local community members, often um, um, communities who live in the town. Okay, and uh, what do they look for? Freshness, price, size, shell color, uh, the variety, because we have uh, distinct two types of eggs, uh, what we call the Habesha egg and the Ferengi egg, but it has to do with the breed of the, of the chicken uh, that gives the egg. Uh, and uh, they emphasized a lot about the honesty of the retailer, so trust is an issue. Um, and then uh, how about the demand and supply, uh, uh, the trends in demand and supply, they, they've identified that there is a high seasonality. Uh, during May, September, that's where the demand is the highest, and during Eastern and Christmas feast day, uh, holidays, uh, which would lead to uh, increases in price. And then demand is very low during fasting season. Uh, and some, some of the traders then shift to other activities or would rely on uh, larger traders who negotiate lower prices to purchase uh, their eggs. Next slide, please. Um, some of the constraints uh, that were, the business constraints that were identified by the traders uh, include transportation issues, the storage, uh, access to credit, uh, the volatile price and the limited demand uh, or the high seasonality of the demand, um, chicken health, uh, which, uh, for example, Newcastle disease, the low veterinary support, uh, which would then eventually uh, lead to production fluctuations. Um, and, and as indicated earlier, the high seasonality um, uh, partly related to chicken health, but also uh, the fasting season primarily. Um, an illustrative quote here uh, from a trader in the Yetila market. There is a big, quote unquote, there is a big problem for egg traders. This is the package of eggs during transportation. For example, more than 100 eggs were broken when I transported them to Magali City last January. Had there been any good technology for handling of eggs, we would have not lost profit. Currently, we face many breakage of eggs during transportation. Just to give you an idea of the frustrations of the traders uh, when it comes to transport and storage. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, as uh, Ashley indicated, we did card sorting. So this is uh, trying to understand the perspective of households uh, and what they think about animal source foods. Uh, so the card sorting were done by domains, health, healthiness, acceptability, uh, the time it takes to prepare availability and affordability, and we're ranked from uh, not at all to uh, somewhat and very likely. So the, the higher the number, the, 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 the more positively perceived the, 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 the food is. So um, what we have uh, in the table is a comparison between the different animal source foods uh, in terms of healthiness, acceptability, and time preparation time and availability and affordability. And the take home here is that eggs are uh, by far uh, the, the ones that are most, uh, mostly perceived as healthy, acceptable, taking less time to prepare, and um, available and affordable. So uh, if we have to choose among animal source foods, uh, then eggs would hold the highest potential. Next, please. We also uh, continued asking the, pers the, the perspectives of the households uh, and to understand better uh, how, the mar how the purchase uh, of animal source foods happen. Um, we asked who visits the market and um, basically men, women um, both uh, visit the market and children also make small purchases from vendors uh, when it's close to home. Um, we also asked if they do some planning and if they stick with the planning they make. Uh, when they visit the market, uh, what we found out is that women, re women reported having a loose plan uh, that can change due to product price, quality, and weekly income. So, um, yes, they have a list of things that they want to buy, but uh, external factors uh, do matter, and, uh, what, uh, and, and what they see at the marketplace uh, can uh, change uh, their plans. Um, the marketplace is a place where they socialize. They enjoy their trips to the market. Uh, they talk about food, but also other, other, other um, social matters. Um, we also observed that, that snacking is, uh, happens at the market. 
uh, men and children uh, consume snacks uh, such as uh, tea, bread with tea, um, but also occasionally sugar cane, biscuits, corn, and hard boiled eggs uh, were some of the foods that were mentioned. Um, we also asked them, okay, if you had unlimited budget, um, then well, what would be some of the foods that you would purchase uh, that you're not purchasing now or would, uh, would buy more? So uh, here, what was interesting is that they reported that they would buy more and more of a higher quality food. And then what, they, uh, what was mentioned as higher quality food was meat, honey, and butter. So it gives you an idea of the issue of uh, affordability is, is, is removed then the kind of dietary choices uh, that would be made by these households. Next slide. So based on the file, on the uh, on, on on what we've learned from the perspective of the households, uh, as Ashley indicated, we developed some concepts uh, that we uh, tested. So the first concept is about loving your child, and so and 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 and, and translated by giving them eggs uh, to help them grow strong and smart. Um, the second concept that we tested is about boiled eggs as a convenient, tasty. Uh, treat uh, that go uh, whenever you go, wherever you go. So uh, some illustrative quotes of what they, what, what they thought about the concept. So about the loving your child, I like the idea uh, um, uh, as eggs are important to children and we have to express our love by giving them uh, care and by feeding them as said by a uh, mother in Yejula Tam. Uh, a father in housing, uh, quote unquote, says, "If we love our children, we will provide aid. As the result, as a result, they grow fast and will have a bright mind." Um, so they, they do uh, like the concept, and uh, this is uh, they can relate to this concept. And but looking at the concept too, boiled eggs being convenient and uh, going uh, going wherever you go. You would uh, this this illustration uh, this quote is is really interesting. Uh, father from housing says, "I didn't advise my wife to take boiled egg for our child during her travels. It never came to uh, our mind. But when I see this message, eggs are really incompatible with any other food in terms of their convenience to handle, and they are also tasty. Uh, so this has kind of ignited a new." Uh, a new thinking of, of how eggs could be used in the community. Next slide, please. So the third one is, is about uh, fasting uh, as one of the barrier for um, feeding animal source foods uh, for children. Um, here we um, took an excerpt from a narrative uh, from a, an earlier project by 11 tribe. Um, so we read the excerpt and then we asked uh, we asked households and uh, discussants, what do they think about it? So the, the excerpt is, is, is as follows. One priest gave a sermon which said, quote unquote, we all know that our religion requires those above age seven to fast. But in, the young but, but in our households, the young children are not eating a variety of foods. During fasting, they are eating the same thing as the adults. We are essentially making them fast. We have to feed our children eggs and milk from their, for, for their proper growth. Parents have the responsibility to ensure this happens. So when we asked, what do you think about this? Um, just to give you some illustration, a mother from Ijilla says, I think it is positive. He, the, the priest, is helping the community members to prevent from different risks. And I expect the other family members will have the same perception. Um, another quote from a father in Hausin, I would like to appreciate the project method to tackle the concerns of the community using the most trusted source of information among families, which is the Christian Orthodox Church. Next slide, please. So this then moving from uh, the concept testing to also trying some practices that could address some of the challenges that were mentioned by the traders early on. Uh, we tried different practices. Uh, first one is uh, oil dipping eggs. So oiling your eggs to extend the shelf life. So you clean your eggs and then you, uh, you oil them to, and, and it's uh, proven to uh, extend uh, the shelf life uh, quite dramatically. Um, so we uh, presented uh, this, this idea, this practice, 
And uh, this is the negotiation process. Uh, and we learn about opportunities that the traders see in this practice, the challenges, is, the challenges they foresee, and then we also um, ask them, okay, what would you propose as solutions to the challenges that you've identified? Uh, so the, this practice of oiling eggs, um, the traders found that this could have, an, this could have a potential during fasting. Uh, instead of lowering the price due to low demand, traders can extend the shelf life and sell when prices are better. Uh, they also said that consumers can benefit because when the price is lower, they can buy more and store them. Uh, they also thought that cleaned and oiled eggs may be more attractive. But they also saw some challenges with this practice. Uh, because the oiling needs to, is, is more effective if, you, if it's done right after laying, uh, right after the eggs are laid, uh, they also identify that it could be difficult to know when exactly the eggs were laid. Uh, concerns uh, was, were also raised about um, maybe the oiled egg would absorb more dirt, uh, and then oiling large quantities uh, would be uh, difficult and could lead to a large uh, number of eggs being broken. And, and the source of egg is mainly from rural communities, and if they store oiled eggs until there is a better selling price, it could become expensive for the end users. Um, uh, so these were, these were some of the challenges they've identified and possible solutions were, okay, we need to create more awareness about the value of this practice and we, for that we need some help. Uh, we, use, we need to use different platforms, radio, et cetera, uh, community meetings, et cetera. Next slide, please. The second practice that we, uh, we, we discussed with the traders is the hard-boiled eggs as a, 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 as a snack food that could be sold at a marketplace. Um, so the opportunities that they saw is that, well, there's a potential to sell more uh, than fresh eggs. Um, and, and I also identified that rural mothers are selling their eggs to buy more expensive packaged goods like biscuits, perhaps with adequate promotion, this could provide an alternative for uh, rural mothers uh, uh, to buy eggs. Uh, they also identified uh, the practice as, uh, as it could create job opportunity for many of the adolescents who, who, who do not have a job at the moment. Um, they find the practice to be relatively easy, not expensive, and they could boil a number um, up to 100 at a time. But the challenge is that Boiled egg, traditionally, when sold at the market, is for men, and it's uh, perceived as a cure for hangover. So you need to repurpose that to be able to sell it for mothers and children. Uh, mothers from rural communities believe also that they can do this at home. Once they see the practice at the marketplace, why buy? They, they could have the reflection that we can do this at home. Uh, traders are also not always trusted by the communities. And so, um, uh, and related to that, they've uh, also said that if we do this practice, we need to do it in front of uh, our customers at the marketplace. Other than that, they might think that we are using um, eggs that have gone off uh, and, um, or, uh, or you know, cracked eggs, etc., to to make uh, uh, this 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 food. Um, another issue is that you know markets do also happen on Wednesdays and Fridays, which are also fasting days. And so then, how would you then practice this? And how then, for example, the market happens on Wednesday, would you be able to sell the eggs? No, it would be an absurd uh, practice uh, boiling the eggs, uh, thinking that it would be bought um, at the marketplace on a Wednesday in housing. For so some of the solutions that they um, uh, think could, 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 could be applied is maybe preparing eggs in the form of a biscuit uh, to draw the attention of children and mothers. Um, also the importance of boiled eggs to children should be promoted by more trusted uh, stakeholders like health extension workers. Uh, and once that comes in, then uh, they're, uh, are, uh, they're, when they practice it, they would be more trusted. Um, offering a discount or a bonus egg at the beginning as a promotion was also one solution that was mentioned. And then promoting uh, boiled egg at the market day 
uh, was also mentioned as another option. Next slide, please. So the third practice uh, is, 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 is related to what we just saw. It's about offering a discount and, and the feasibility and viability of that practice. So the, the traders saw some opportunities. The discount would help attract customers when there is less demand. Uh, and they also identified the fasting season uh, as a possible period where they could probably offer some discount. And also, well, okay, you've talked about oiling eggs. Maybe if we oil the eggs and extend the shelf life, we might be able to uh, do some discounting. But the challenge is that it's difficult to uh, set the margins because it depends on external factors, season, the chicken feed, etc. Um, and they also, again, this is very important, they also said that offering a discount does not help the rural communities because they may lose income from the sale of eggs. Uh, they also, again, reiterated, main customers are cafeterias, restaurants, and traders from big towns. Thus, young children from rural communities will not benefit from the price discounts. So difficult to know also who actually has young children to, so that they can target the, the discount. So as a solution they proposed, well, uh, discounts may be a seasonal opportunity. Uh, we probably need also mothers with infants and young children to register in, in one way or another so that we can identify them and offer them a discount. Um, but that they highlighted that chicken production should be encouraged in rural communities if we want rural communities to consume more eggs. Next slide, please. The last practice that we uh, that that aimed to uh, co-create a practice that would ad address some of the storage and transport issues that were mentioned as business constraints, um, they saw that the opportunities would be for such an improved uh, transportation and packaging system or storage system would be avoiding breakage and cracking of eggs uh, as it's slowing down their cells. Um, some of the practices that could happen would be maybe storing the eggs on a, in a cold area, like on a cement floor, um, but also engaging carpenters, local carpenters who can make wooden objects and structures to hold eggs. They've also identified that egg trays, they are the ones that are available, are not adapted for small scales, less than 30 eggs. And they also complain that it is mainly the trader's issue. It's not an issue of, of chicken producers in the town. Um, and the cost of improved packaging or storage may not be affordable by the rural communities. Um, so what, what are some of the solutions that we will see? Well, they said maybe a modified egg tray could assist uh, us in, in better storage, but also in allowing us to um, perform the oil dipping. So we see here, all of a sudden that some of the practices are no more independent. You've got traders that are now thinking, okay, we need to dip it in oil, make a storage that would allow us to do that and, and making connections among the different practices. So after the tips, the trials of improved practices, most traders were willing to continue the practice, but indicated that they needed support at, the, at least at the beginning. Next slide, please. So the take home, uh, as a summary, among animal source foods, eggs have a great potential as they are available and accessible, but they are relatively expensive compared to cereals. Uh, rural households buy eggs from the market, but only if their production does not meet their needs or if they don't produce eggs at all. And households procure eggs not only from the physical marketplace, but also from informal markets, uh, example, neighbors. Um, and efforts to make eggs more affordable through discounts may not work uh, due to one, potential consumers are also the producers and traders want higher prices to increase their profits. Next slide, please. We also identified cultural barriers, boiled eggs sold at the marketplace at a hangover cure. So selling hard boiled eggs at the marketplace is also a job for young kids. And so uh, if you're as part of a project, then uh, you can't engage young kids to do the job. You would want to convince or um, uh, uh, adults to do the job. But this is now uh, considered as a young kid's job. That no trader would want to, uh, uh, to, to, to sell uh, hard-boiled eggs at the market uh, or some radical um, 
uh, intervention is needed to promote uh, this practice. Uh, the fear of contaminating utensils during fasting uh, was mentioned, and, and here religious leaders' engagement in social behavior change communication is needed, and it was found acceptable as seen in the testing of the concepts uh, um, as, as seen earlier. Uh, but community level dialogues may be needed to change norms, norms and behaviors to our, towards child feeding during fasting because you can't have one or two individuals just changing. Uh, it's quite sensitive and culturally, uh, yeah, it would require uh, making a hard decision and which is unlikely. So you would probably need to um, have community level changes. Um, so the high seasonal variability, uh, the demand being high before major feasts and low during fasting is one issue. Um, all of these suggest that understanding the perspectives of both the traders and households, sometimes they are the same, can enable a better identification of entry points for food systems interventions. Next slide, please. So now with this, we're planning a third round of formatted research uh, that will allow us to gain a more in-depth understanding of the egg purchase, sell, and consumption uh, in rural communities, uh, and understand better the informal sector uh, and how it works and how significant the role of this sector is in the supply chain. Um, this is uh, to inform the future intervention, but also the study, of the, the, the study design of the cluster randomized trial to evaluate the impact of the intervention. Um, next slide, thank you, this is it. And I would like to now hand, hand it over to Megan. Wonderful, so, so many thanks to Alyssa, Alyssa, Ashley, and Kalop for such an interesting and rich presentation. I know there's um, a lot of interesting findings from your formative research and it's hard to condense it into a short presentation. Um, so I, I appreciate how well you've done that. We have just under 15 minutes for um, our question and answer session. So I'm going to get right into our, our Q&A. And Kalab, actually, I would love for you to answer the first question. Um, we had a number of questions come in around egg supply. Um, so if you could expand on, you know, was egg supply a challenge? in the formative research? And what were the assumptions for not looking at availability and supply of eggs to markets and um, to sellers? So um, if you could expand on, on these questions around availability and supply of eggs and how that uh, factored into the formative research, that would be great. Yep, um, so uh, egg availability, um, so, so we, we looked at supply and demand from the perspective of traders. And as part of that, we've uh, learned that there is a seasonality in the, in the, in the supply of eggs, uh, but as well as on the demand, in the demand of eggs. Um, but we, uh, in this two formative uh, research, in, the, in these two rounds of formative research, the focus was to understand um, what kind of interventions we could have uh, given the limited uh, time that we have to intervene and uh, within the budget uh, frame that we are working under. Um, so it, it was a bit difficult to, uh, you know, we're unlikely to change the supply chain, which would take, uh, you know, much more uh, time uh, and, and budget. And but we also learn from the perspective of the households during the card sorting that uh, um, availability was not perceived as an issue uh, when it comes to eggs. So we had to trust uh, the information that we get from, uh, from, from the households. On top of that, we had some secondary analysis um, of, the, of the supply chain, the value chain, the availability of eggs, et cetera, which already exists. Uh, and so we, we had already that information at the background. Wonderful, thank you so much, Caleb. Ashley, I'm going to throw the next question to you. And we have a series of questions on kind of the gender dynamics um, that you saw during the formative research. So I'm going to read these out. Were mothers and fathers from the same families? How much was known, considered, or learned about, and what were the implications of the gender dynamics of household level decision-making? Were these understandings emergent or known going into the research? And did mothers and fathers have comparable and consistent perspectives during the formative research? 
Great, thanks, Megan. Um, so sometimes the moms were the moms and fathers were from the same families, but uh, we did not. That wasn't a prerequisite um, for recruiting them. We were looking for we had very small samples. We were just more looking for sort of typical mothers and fathers who would who would shop at the markets that we were targeting when we talked to the um, traders. Um, we had there's a lot of secondary data and other formative research that has been done around gender dynamics in um, making decisions about household production, purchasing, and diets. Um, so we had some ideas going in, uh, but we used the uh, focus group discussions um, and the discussion of the food ranking um, just to confirm and refine um, those ideas a little bit. So both uh, men and women uh, shop. Um, uh, in the marketplace, the structured observation, we saw that women tended to be, you know, broadly generalizing, women tended to be more in the um, sort of produce sections, men tended to be more in the sort of livestock sections or hanging out, um, eating their hard boiled eggs for the next morning after. Um, so there were some gender, you know, dynamics that we knew going in. Uh, we were kind of surprised, and I'm so glad somebody asked the question, Perspectives and responses of fathers and mothers, uh, both in the focus group discussions and in the uh, concept testing were quite similar to each other. There wasn't a big difference of opinion between men and women. The only uh, really interesting gender difference that we noticed was um, in the focus group discussions we asked, uh, why do some households eat differently than others in this community? Um, and, and they answered, um, you know, the typical things you would expect, they have different knowledge, different beliefs, different resources available to them to buy food. Um, and men and women both said all of those things. But the women said, hey, it also depends on health status of family members. And the men did not point that out because the women are the ones who care for the sick and the elderly. And they realize that those people might have special dietary needs. So that's really the only big gender difference we saw. Otherwise, it was very, it, it very much, um, supported what we already know that you know men do have a lot of influence over how money is spent um but a general idea that that you know men and women are open to making these decisions together and uh in terms of their attitudes and beliefs around foods and eggs in particular they were very similar and you know loving their kids and wanting to show that by feeding them good food great thank you so much ashley um, Kalib, I'm going to throw this next set of questions to you again. Um, we had a series of questions come in on the egg traders. So can you elaborate on the different types of egg traders you observed and the constraints that they face? Are these mostly traders purchasing eggs from poultry farms or aggregating from smallholders directly? Can you also speak about the volatility of egg prices across seasons? Yep. Um, so we focused on uh, the traders that are formally selling eggs at uh, the marketplace, the physical marketplace, and uh, they happen to be um, traders that receive um, supplies from producers, uh, farmers, uh, but also from aggregators that are in the middleman um, uh, buying some eggs and also selling it to, the, to these uh, traders. Uh, and they they are aiming uh, to sell uh, once they they um, they buy the the supplies they are aiming to sell it to uh, larger towns or uh, nearby towns. Um, so basically, um, these are formal traders that have a constant uh, um, trading place at the market at the marketplace. Um, the the next question was. The question was around, uh, can you speak to the volatility of prices? For yes, yes, yes. So the, the price volatility has to do, uh, so the, 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 the demand is high during uh, May and May to September uh, because production is seemed to be low as reported by uh, the traders and, and households. Uh, and it's, uh, so that during that time, uh, it's pretty high. And also um, during the holiday seasons, in Christmas, Easter, and that's where the demand is high, then the price increases. During the fasting season, it's, 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 at, the, it's at the lowest. So the, the, the land fasting, for example, the longest period of fasting, just before Easter, that's where it, the, the price uh, is very low. So it's, it has to do with production and fasting season. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much. So our next question is around. I, sorry, before we move on, I just wanted to underscore one thing that Kala was saying. I think um, the biggest challenge that Safira has actually been having in terms of designing what our intervention package can be within our scope ha is actually related to the to that trader question. Um, you know, as Khaled mentioned, the the traders in those markets, what we found was that even though they are they were very willing to try the practices and tips, and they were like engaged and, and interested. Um, they are mostly buying the eggs from the household producers and then selling them outside of those of the local markets that we're working in. So when we're we're trying to look for interventions, um, you know, within markets on the supply side, that that has been one of our biggest challenges is that they they really are taking those eggs, they're buying them from traders, selling them to hotels, selling them to restaurants. They're not really selling. There's not really like a, a robust market selling those eggs back into households in the communities, and that that has actually been one of our biggest um, challenges and and one of the most interesting findings that we had not expected. Great, thanks, Alessa. Yeah, I think that underscores a really important point and why kind of we at USAID are so eager to see this third round of formative research unpack those dynamics a, a bit more before we go into the intervention phase. So the, the fourth question, um, I, Kalab or Ashley, I'll let either one of you answer this. Um, we had a question about priests and their exposure. Do they have exposure about the importance of eggs or feeding during fasting? And can you talk a little bit more about the concepts that you tested around um, using sermons um, and those in the relig religious communities to help um, you know, promote the consumption of eggs? Um, so we were building off, uh, for this example of the priests, we were um, building off of really good work from Alive and Thrive. Uh, they had actually uh, published on their website a case study of an actual project uh, where they promoted eggs um, for small children during fasting this way, by engaging religious leaders in a community and asking them um, to promote um, eggs in their sermons or other meetings with community members or one-on-one. -on -one. And um, they did have some improvement in egg consumption in, in that uh, area where they tried that. So we just took the case study that Alive and Thrive had published and we adapted it um, as a concept to test um, in this concept testing. Um, and yeah, what we, what we asked after we kind of shared the story of this is what the priests were saying about eating eggs and why it's okay to eat eggs for kids um, and even okay to prepare and feed them if you're an adult uh, during fasting to your small children. And then um, the case study also talked about reactions from different community members. So we were able in the concept testing to test, you know, one mother sort of approved of the priest doing this and the other one sort of disapproved. So we were able to ask people, uh, one, did they consider it appropriate for priests to be talking about this? And two, which parent, which mother did they feel was in the right uh, and why about this issue? So that's the way that we kind of turn this case study from Alive and Thrive into um, a story that we could test as a concept with parents. And we found that they very much approved of the priests doing that. And they basically said, yeah, if, if the priests say it's okay, it's probably okay, but we need to change this as a social thing and not count on one family to kind of stick their neck out and try it first. Uh, so I encourage you to look at Alive and Thrive's documentation to learn more about their project. Thanks so much, Ashley. So we only have about a minute left, and I, I see that we have many more questions to get through. So we um, will probably only be able to get through one or two more, but I appreciate everyone's kind of engagement and participation. Um, Kalob, can you expand on how um, Safira will understand or measure whether egg consumption has increased in children. Um, will this be monitored in the community? Yeah, um, so that's uh, part of the plan. Uh, when we do a, um, the cluster randomized controlled trial, it would be a controlled trial where you would have a controlled community uh, and that would allow you whether um, your intervention is having an impact or is it's, uh, or if it's a more uh, a general trend whereby uh, consumption of egg is increasing for everyone. Um, so we will, um, we're hoping that we will have answers uh, on that when we do the controlled, randomized controlled trial. 
to see if at all our intervention can improve uh, consumption of eggs. But looking at uh, the literature and also reanalyzing some of the data that we have, uh, in the past, we've seen quite a, a dramatic increase. No, dramatic, no, quite an increase uh, in, in the in the consumption of eggs. Uh, looking at DHS rounds, but it's still pretty low. We are twenty something percentage uh, for Tigray. So there is room to improve. Great, thank you so much. And unfortunately, it's ten a.m. now, so we're going to have to close. Alyssa, I did want to see if you wanted to provide any closing remarks or to talk about where people would be able to find more information about Safira um, and future publications and things of that nature. Great, thank you, Megan. Thanks everyone so much for joining us. Um, so as you can hear, we're really at the beginning um, stages of this project. Uh, we will be publishing um, a couple of reports in the coming weeks and months. Um, IFPRI will be publishing um, in their journal um, a report looking at the full egg value chain in Tigray, both from our findings from our formative research, but also from other work that they have been doing and from other existing um, national and local data sets. Um, so that will be coming soon. We will also have a few blog posts going out soon, um, talking about some of our methodology and our findings on the JSI website. Um, and the findings from the first two rounds of formative research will be published in a peer-reviewed journal uh, in the next few months, we'll share it around with everybody who's registered once that, um, once that takes place. Um, along with the slides and um, recording for this presentation, we can also share a link to um, where you can get some more information about Safira on the JSI website as well. Um, please feel free to reach out to any of us as well. If you have any questions that weren't answered, we're happy to, to share. Um, like I said, we're hoping to get out and do the last round of formative research within the next few months, um, but we're being cognizant of safety and then, um, you know, we're going to move from there. So that's where we are right now. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's joining us and really great questions and engagement this morning. So thank you all. <laughs>